when, when you're going to talk, you, you, you practice, you figure out what you're going to say, and, and then the day happens. And I just, all morning, I kept thinking, I really wish I never met Jennifer. <laughs> I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. I, had the fires not happened, I wouldn't know her. And it just takes me back to, to the very fact that we don't know what's good and bad, and we have to be thankful for both. I am, I am very thankful to have met Jennifer and to know Jennifer and to have worked with her, but I really wish I never had to know her. And I know that's, a, that's the feeling across this room is that, that it, it's a horrible thing that we all have to come together and talk about what we're talking about. But, we, but it can be good. It can be good. Um, Tim Carpenter, Fannie Mae, why is Fannie Mae care? Fannie Mae, here's the two minute, one and a half minute commercial. Fannie Mae, we buy loans, we buy mortgages, we buy a lot of mortgages. We, we hold about one out of every four mortgages in the country. We hold about 20% of all multifamily mortgages, apartment mortgages in the country. And so when disaster happens, we're impacted. Our portfolio, our book is impacted. I've been at Fannie over 25 years now, and when, when Harvey happened, and Maria happened, and then the Tubbs fire happened, Fannie said, look, Tim, you've been, you've been at Fannie for, this, for, for a long time, live outside of New Orleans, so I, of course, am a disaster expert, of course. You know, I know everything because I live outside of New Orleans and, and lost my first home family did when I was 11. So, I, you know, I know disasters. They, they said, why don't you take over this disaster group? And, and we go in and we try to work with communities, try to get boots on the ground, try to come in and, and understand what's happening, what's not happening, and how can we improve it. And I get called, we meet with Jennifer, and I knew fire. I knew how to spell fire. That's about all I knew about fire. But she's, she's brought us in community after community after community. And, and now I have a, I'm no longer a novice. I have an understanding. But what I do know is that no matter what we do, we can't do enough. And there are communities that are not being served and communities that, that miss out. And with that, we're going to play a quick clip. In Bucksport, South Carolina, the battles are fought through faith and community. People here can trace their roots back to over a century of life on this land, which has been passed down generation to generation, often informally, without a will. The legal term for that is heirs' property. It's always called family land. It was only after post-flooding that we understood that had a legal ramification to it as well. Bucksport is in an increasingly flood-prone region. Back-to-back -back hurricanes in recent years devastated the area, and in 2018, Hurricane Florence destroyed Hazel Bellamy's home. Yeah, that's that water line from Florence. She found out she lives on Eric's property when she applied for FEMA aid. They couldn't approve us for certain things. It was a nightmare. Hazel's name is not on the deed. None of her living relatives are either. That meant they couldn't prove the land was theirs according to long-standing FEMA funding requirements. Heirs property owners can't get a mortgage, have limited to no access to housing repair money because you cannot prove clear ownership. FEMA's new policy will change that by expanding the list of documentation they'll accept for individual assistance. But heirs property owners are still not in the clear. At any moment, an heir could sell his or her share, which then makes everybody vulnerable to having their property lost. When someone dies without a will, their heirs, kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, and so on, all own the land jointly as tenants in common. A property could end up with hundreds of part owners, and if just one of them decides to sell their share, that could result in the forced sale of the entire property below market value. About 60% of African-American-owned land is heirs' property and vulnerable to land grabs. Bucksport, just 30 miles from Myrtle Beach, is a prime target for developers. Development can be good and bad, but when you're in heirs' property, it's definitely going to be a bad thing. 
And it's not just a problem for black Americans. It impacts the Native American community, people in Appalachia and the Latino colonias on the border. Ayers property is an issue among low-income folk. Low-income folk do not sit around the dinner table and discuss estate planning. And fixing it is often unaffordable. Hazel's family paid a lawyer $7,000 to update their deed. And did it get you guys anywhere? Nope. They wanted more money, and we couldn't afford it. Are you worried that you might not be able to protect this property? I am. This is our home. This is what our parents left us. This is our heritage. This is where we belong. Dasha Burns, NBC News, Bucksport, South Carolina. I, I could go on a long conversation about Ayers, Ayers property, but I thought this was a good clip to, to, to help bring it home, help describe what it truly is. I, I being outside, living outside of New Orleans, I, I came across Ayers property. First time, I'm, I'm like, oh, this, this has got to be a New Orleans thing. We do things different in Louisiana, I'll admit. But, but it's gotta be a New Orleans thing. And then, then, we, then we saw it again in Puerto Rico. And we saw it again in, in, in Harvey, uh, Hurricane Harvey af, af, in, in Florida. And it's like, this is not just a Louisiana thing. And Sidra, my, my, uh, my friend and coworker, will tell you that after, after Puerto Rico, after Maria, every meeting, that I attended at Fannie Mae, any gathering, any time more than two were together, I'd raise my hand and ask, well, what about heirs? What are we doing about heirs? Are you aware of heirs? And, and after, after a few years of beating up people talking about heirs, they said, Tim, shut up. Here, have some money, go give some money to some groups and do some studies and do, find out some stuff. And, and we, we worked with a group in, in Louisiana, worked with a group in Alabama, worked in a group in, in Florida, and, and discovered a little bit more. And I came back to Fannie, and I said, here, here, here's some information. And they said, no, you know how we work. We need data. We, we, need, to know, we need to know how big is this problem. If, you know, if we, we, we've got $4 trillion worth of mortgages, that we hold, and we just don't do something unless we understand understand the data. And it's like, okay, how big is it? It's big. That was my answer. It's big because, like they were saying, you can't get help. Yes, you can now get IA, and everybody here knows that IA you can get up to forty five thousand five hundred. Anybody know it except Chris? You can't answer. Anybody know anybody that got full IA funding? We know that, that IA is only, is only going to be a fraction of that amount. And IA alone can't get them home. They can't get DR money. They can't get an SBA loan. They can't get those fundings. The, the Inflation Reduction Act, all the weatherization, all of that money, if you don't have title, you can't get it. You won't, you won't have the resources to get your house fixed. You, you won't be able to, to tap into the equity in your home to fix your roof or to, to come up with the additional, uh, the additional funding. That, that fly is nice, isn't it? <laughs> the, the, the additional money that you need to finish your rebuild. You, you also just get lost in the system. So, Tim, what are the numbers? What are the numbers? I found out, because we buy so many mortgages, we have a couple lists that we have access to. We have a list of every single mortgage in, this, in the country. We have an access to a list of every single tax record in the country. And if you take those two lists together, you can start coming up with some different characteristics to try to identify heirs. And our work in Florida and, and Alabama and Louisiana gave us an indication we were able to find areas where, where people had done the research county by, in, in, in one individual county or one area and said, it, heirs look like this, this, and this, and this. I am not going to tell you exactly what categories we used because I won't tell anybody because I'm not going to give those bad guys that want to steal property a map to how to find heirs' property. 
I, I will say this. In 1910, black farmers owned 19 million acres of land in this country. Today, black farmers may own 4 million acres of land in this country. As they said, it's not just African Americans. It's, it's across, across the, the, the entire country. So we contacted a group called the Housing Assistance Council, HAC, one of the foremost nonprofit organizations involved in rural housing. We took data from 3,150 plus counties, all collected differently, as you know. Every county does all of their data differently. We took that, that information, we pulled it all together, and we had to come up with a way to make whatever we decided in Alabama could be used in Nevada. We did fail in six states where we don't think the, the, the data was good enough and we couldn't stand by those numbers. That number is only residential property. It's not vacant land, it's not commercial, it's, it, it, is, it is only, it's not farmland, it's only residential properties. It is super low. It is a baseline. It is wrong because it is so low. I can promise you in Hawaii, it does not accurately count or identify the, home, the Hawaiian homelands. I can promise you that in, in, it, it does not count any land in, held in federal trust because counties don't have that. I can promise you it is, it is off, but it's our baseline. Now when they ask what, what's the size? I can say, I know it's at least $32 billion of property that's not being touched. $32 billion of property that we started seeing, we, we started seeing it, that it would cluster. These, these properties would cluster and it wouldn't be just one heir's property on a street or an area, it's five. And these properties are the deferred maintenance is a kind word. These properties, uh, in many cases, are falling apart because they don't have access to the funding. I don't, I'm, I'm not able to go out and get a mortgage. And I can't, I can't even sell it. Why would I put that money into it? Not everyone that has heirs property is, is in need of cleaning it up. There are some situations where you shouldn't. Elderly aunt, sick, on Medicaid, doesn't have clear title, don't clean her up, don't, don't work to clean up that loan, that, that, that property. Because when she dies, Medicaid will go after recovery and take her land if she has clear title. There, there are situations where family members have, have made it work, where, where, where the family house is the safe place for people who need a place to live at times. There's, there's other ways that it, 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 it might work in that system, in that situation but it, it doesn't work across the country. When we start looking at, at the, the states, these are the top 10 states where heirs property are, but it was that, that first mention of where they are. Two, two out of three are in rural communities. And we start looking at, I wonder where fires happen. Anybody know? We know that fires, the prominent area of fires are in rural communities. This is, an, this is an issue that we all have to focus on. This is an issue that, that we, we need to make sure that when we're talking with our leadership about the action plan for the CDB GDR, that AIRS is part of that conversation. When, we, when we're talking to people about what we need to do as we have the community together, we have to talk about estate planning. You know, it's, it's, it's great to say you need a will. And that's right, you do need a will. But, but if, if grandmother writes a will that says, I'm leaving the house to all three children and to the grandchildren, we have now created an heir's problem. We've got to do this in a way that is it, it's truly legal counseling and financial counseling. And that's not something that you can do on a website without getting in big trouble. And so it's got to be 
it's got to be one by one. Every time we get people together, especially low-income people, low-income families, we've got to make sure that they do talk about death and that they do talk about planning and that they do talk about how can we build and save these assets. Home ownership is, is about stability. Home ownership is about building wealth. Home ownership is about families. But if, if, if you don't have clear title, you don't know that that stability is going to be there. You, you, don't, you know the, the, the wealth is not going to be there. And it's just something that we have to move forward with. OK. All of this is great. I love all of this stuff. But it always leads to an important question, the so what. And the so what is me asking you to, one, download the report. I'm waiting. Everybody get the phones. <laughs> two, as we talk about disaster and disaster recovery, know that we have to think about heirs. Know that we have to have that in the conversation. Um, working on heirs has been included in at least one action plan that I'm aware of. It was included in the Florida action plan, uh, in a Florida action plan. It, it is something that, that we have to talk about often, and it is something that we cannot resolve with one pro bono attorney working with one family at a time because we'll never get there. We've got, we've got to make it a conversation with, with a big, much bigger audience. The first time I started talking about airship at Fannie Mae, the legal came back and said, oh, so we're talking about air rights? It's no, air's property. Is that a, is that a rock band? It, it, it'll take some time, but it's something that we can all have impact on. The so what for me is that now Fannie's going to keep going, put more information on our website to help direct people to, the res to some of the resources out there. When we work disaster, what we've learned is that in a positive way, first, we know that every community has an affordable housing crisis. Disaster happens, and that crisis is, ma is magnified. It's, it, it's, it's to a, a, the power of 10 in some cases. What we also know is the political will to do something about housing, sometimes for the first time in, 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 in our lives, the, the political will is there to do something different. To, to try something new. And, and, and at this point, what we do with, with disaster communities is try to come up with new ways to do it, new ways to come out of forbearance, new ways to come up with, with products that can provide financing for, for nonprofits to buy, to buy homes and, and to, to make them affordable for rentals. We are going to try to come up with an heirs property product. Um, we, we have a, an existing product that's a, a cash out refi. Again, we don't make the loans, we buy them. We, we put out the guidelines and our lenders go out and, and do the work and then deliver the loan to us. Cash out refi in, the, in our present guidelines doesn't work at all because with this cash out refi, you'd now have, we need to, to give it enough money to the, to the, the owner class slash buyer to buy out the other family members. We need to allow maybe a little higher amount of money to be paid to the lawyers for the legal work. And we need to have make sure there's enough cash out to fix the roof. Our, our guidelines don't work today with that cash out refi. So we're going to change the whole thing and play again and, 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 and try it. We may fail at this one. But we're going to try. What, what we saw after, after Harvey and after Maria and after the Tubbs fires was that communities didn't know how to do disaster. And even the housing advocates 
don't know how to do disaster. They're not trained in, in working with insurance companies, working with proceeds, working with, with, with forbearance procedures. And so one of the things we set up was a national disaster and hardship counseling platform where we're a nonprofit 24 seven across the country can, can be called. Anyone being impacted by a hardship or disaster can get help through our Here to Help network. And this Here to Help network, we, when we set it up and hired this nonprofit to run it, one of the first things we said was, we don't wanna just make it another 1-800 number. There are too many 1-800 numbers. Let's make it to where if Tim calls, Tim gets assigned Jennifer, and Jennifer is my, my advisor, my counselor. And for free, whether you're a homeowner or a renter, for free, we say for 18 months, but it can go longer, Tim and Jennifer talk. And Tim doesn't have to tell Jennifer, well, and then I had to move my parents in and my dad died, and, and then, 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 then I lost my job. Jennifer knows all that after our first conversation. And Jennifer says, Tim, look, I'm, I want you to do these three things. Jennifer doesn't tell me, I want you to do these 20 things. She gives me that small list and says, do these three things, and then let's talk next Wednesday. And Jennifer understands that I may only get two done, but she's going to be there to support me, to, to tell me it's okay to talk to your mortgage company, to tell you the insurance proceeds well, if you take that check, it's, it doesn't mean you can't go back and, and, and fight and ask for more. That if FEMA denies you, Jennifer's going to be there and help me through that appeal. And, and all these pieces are important. We've had over 350,000 people go con contact and work with, with, with our, our disaster response, our Here to Help network. It's free. It's out there. Be aware. One of the first things that, that we, we became very aware of you, you, was, was after Paradise, where everyone paid off their mortgage. Uh, uh, from our book, 95% of the mortgages in Paradise were paid off within the first two months. And it's like, this is not good. Number one, you, you miss out on the potential of an SBA loan if you prepay off your mortgage. Two, you take a, a low-level mortgage today and you pay it off and you have to have perfect credit to get a construction loan. And then three, your new mortgage is gonna be at the higher level than, than the one you paid off. And, and so our, we started working with Jennifer and after the fire and said, let's make sure in every event, the first message is don't pay off your mortgage until you have a plan. And, and we, we saw that in Colorado we, we saw those numbers drop down when that message was put out there. We've seen it in Hawaii. Our, our, pay, our prepay has, has been very low. It's starting to creep up again. We think some of them are going to are, are maybe second home investors that, that, that don't, don't want to stay and are, are, are paying, paying off, but it's not that 95% that we saw in paradise. So, so it's, it's working. All of this says when we jump in and, and Jennifer brings us into that community, we want to be there for you, with you. We want to learn. We want to help. And we want to treat everything holistic. I told you at the beginning we have one out of every four mortgages. Well, if that one mortgage comes back, but the ones around it don't, what good is that house? What good is that, that loan? So we've got to think holistically to say, what can we do for the community? I thank you. I wish I didn't have to know Jennifer. I am thankful for knowing her. And I'm thank you, thankful for all that I've, I've learned and experienced and felt this week. Thank you.
I actually often make the joke um, when it, when it, it's, I mean, I have very few jokes when a disaster happens, but I do start this joke. I'm like, and you get a Fannie Mae, and you get a Fannie Mae, and, but it is a hard thing to break through. So I encourage that for any of you, when you do en encounter a disaster or people or friends are calling you, especially if you have a high social capital to let them know that there are things out there that there actually isn't a catch, uh, you know, there isn't a catch. There's nobody going to come. They're not selling you to a marketing campaign. They're not coming after you. Fannie Mae doesn't care if you if you if you are uh, if you're one of their clients. You can be a renter. You can, and they're HUD approved counselors. So all of that is entirely there for you. And there's also the deferment issue because there's a lot of bad information. Lenders don't even understand it for the most part. That you don't have to do a balloon payment if it doesn't sound right to you then ask again and use the service because they actually do understand what Fannie Mae offers. They do, and I'm just gonna do one thing before I leave you for lunch. <clears throat> um, Sidra Goldwater is also in the back there, my very dear friend as well, and she's been to Maui twice, and Tim went to Maui um, right initially, um, and Sidra is a genius. And so if you go to Sidra and you say, Here's some this puzzle that we see that's happening, like with um, really predatory, lo you know, loans on uh, manufactured on MHPs because I'm not allowed to say trailers. They they keep telling me this for seven years. On you know, for what if you see any kind of um, predatory lending or anything, then then Fannie Mae went back and created a product which actually benefits nonprofits like Community Land Trust, so that. They can buy the land, they will do financing. People can then buy the home, a share essentially, and then they're buying into that as a collective way to have stability and wealth matters, I get it, but it is the stability for the entire community. So Fannie Mae goes way beyond that. I feel like um, Sidra and Tim and the team, they're very responsive to what's actually needed and what can make it much more humane um, in order to go through this really terrible process. So thank you so much, big hand for, a fan, for uh, Tim and for Sidra, thank you.